There's loads of films that interpret the past. But can we really believe what we see in the cinema? I mean, where do film people find out the facts? And do they really care about the truth? We sent out two teams of pupils to find out the answers to these questions. Molly and Joe went to talk to top Hollywood production designers, Jenny and Richard. I'm going to take Jenny's head off. Just yet. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. Also, James and Connie went to the Royal Armouries in Leeds to talk to weapons man and film fan Bob Savage. It's a bit like finding your trainers and having that stamp on it so you know you've got a good sword by this person. And finally, we dropped in on history boffin Robin Lane Fox in his Oxford office. I'm waiting for my Oscar, um, but I believe sometimes there's a delayed effect. If there are two sources, um, how, and they're about the same things, how do you know which one to believe? A good source or a bad source, that's what a true historian has to find out. A source can be written for propaganda purposes or it can be written for a true account. And it can take a lot of critical judgment to be able to work that out. But that's what the historian's job is all about. What sources do you use? Our primary material are the objects from the past themselves. Surviving artefacts, contemporary illustrations and brasses and tapestries. So how does this piece of artwork help you? What this illustration does is show us what was worn beneath the armour. And because the armour is made of metal, that has tended to survive. But te early textiles, because they are made from cloth and other materials, they tend not to survive. So all we have got is perhaps illustrations like this. This sword here with a curved blade is known as a falchion. And as you can see from this illustration, it shows they were used with two hands. And they were used for slashing, delivering slashing blows to cut an opponent. Uh, as you can see, this chap here at the bottom is there pulling on his leg defences. And this one's got his hauberk, his mail shirt. And this one's just putting his helmet on. A great historian told me when I started, it's not enough to rank one source as better than others. It's for us to explain why the totality of surviving sources exist. And even a distorted or, in my view, mistaken source, you must explain why it's taken the total direction it has. So Jenny's got um, one of her books which shows how she builds the idea of the costumes. There's only one reference, which is a mosaic, which they found at Pompeii of Alexander in battle. So we didn't actually have a reference for his sword, so we had to do the best we, we could with the reference that we had to figure out what his sword was. If you didn't have any information like that, how do you find out? You can probably make an inspired guess out of the knowledge you've picked up around and what you've sort of worked out from other things of, of what might be a sensible thing. And then you probably make it and you'll kind of know if it looks mm. right. Yeah. You just get a feeling for it. So it's like very likely that it would have looked like that, but yes. you can't really be no, you sure. You can't be absolutely no. certain. There's no yeah. photographs, obviously, no. that period. Yeah. It's like putting together a jigsaw when you haven't got all the pieces or you haven't got the reference photograph. In a film like this, you know, you are piecing together bits of history. But there are lots of books to look up. There's lots of information in the British Museum, other museums around the world. Of course, the internet is fabulous at yeah. just Internet's pouring it down really the line bad. to you. And as Jenny said, you then come up with your best guess and try it yeah. on, feel it, see if it works, come back and refit it. It's on the swords over here. Um, so it's just this one's just very. Well, this one is um, a reconstruction of a Thracian sword. This was styled on one excavated from a, a grave. The blade shape we just took from the line of the scabbard. Okay. Mm. So when the whole thing's dug out of the ground and it's all rusted solid as a lump, you can interpret the shape of the blade from the shape of the scabbard. Yeah. Historians like Robin Lane Fox have done quite a lot of research into the Romans who came after 
the Greeks, and they fought with the same types of sword, okay. and they documented the way they fought, and then they referred it back to Alexander and the other Greek armies. Now, you can put all these sources side by side, and you can see from overlap that they're using similar lost originals, and that's where the skill comes. Normally, uh, when you start working on a film, um, you obviously read the script, and from the script you make a list of what you're going to need, and quite often when I start to read a script, there's lots of things I don't know, and if it's a historical script, um, script like Alexander, and I'm told there's a consultant we can use, I ask for a meeting with him, but I ask for the meeting when I've got a real good list of questions. I, you know, I'd get any amount of difficult questions. How would they light a fire on an expedition? Would the Persians show body hair? Um, did people, how did they wipe their noses? I think I'd say I do know the evidence through and through. Uh, I then didn't realise that the set designers, the clothes designers, would need further underpinning of advice and um, uh, sounding boards in the scholarly world. And I assembled another group of five, and the production team came down and met here. They had a very clear understanding already, they're great professionals, but they then worked with those five closely. You just put together a whole sort of bank of knowledge and... Uh... And then it's easier to make things up, too, because you're making them up from good knowledge. Uh -huh. So these are just some drawings we did of the different characters with some samples of fabrics and ideas of colours and, and, and pieces of embroidery that we'd use. So we know from um, vases, particularly in the British Museum, there's lots yeah. of really great um, vases and drawings and, on yeah. the vases, what, sort of what they wore. And between Richard and me, we then tried to make the armour and the weapons to make it look as real as possible. Yeah, so this is for the character Craterus. And you can see this would have been made out of bronze. But this one's actually made out of, is it rubber, Jenny? It's a sort it's of rubber. rubber. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the same material they make car bumpers out of. And um, how many people will you have working on a film like Alexander? Um, I had a team of about 40 sculptors, model makers, armour uh, weapons makers. And one of the things that we try and do is to make all the weapons look handmade. Everybody who joined the army came from a little village in Macedonia and they would have a little blacksmith who would make the weapons and the armour and the spears and all the rest of it. And he would make them by hand. He didn't have vast machines to churn them out. So we manufacture them as quickly as we can and then we treat them in such a way to make it look um, handmade. <laughs> Why do you make replicas? We make replica arms and armour so that they can be used to find out how and what they were used for. The sword is made of a various number of parts. One is the blade, the grip and the pommel. The cross piece, this section here, of course protects the hand, but as you can imagine it could also be very useful in becoming a symbol of the cross. So does this, this weight here, does um, that help the soldier carrying the sword to um, wave it and penetrate yes, it the it, enemy? Yes, it does. The other thing is a pommel can also be used, and that was a nice point in the film Kingdom of Heaven, when the Liam Neeson character talks about using a sword. He says you don't just use the, the blade, because the pommel can be used to actually hit somebody in the face as well, following through. In fact, that's where the term, when you pummel somebody, that's where the term comes from today. So how does making replicas such as this one help you discover um, about the object? People who are trained to fight in the old styles, again, using surviving military manuals and uh, illustrations, they can actually then see whether some of these illustrations are true can you do this in armour? Can you fight and do this with the sword? Um, and you can also find out why things happened. A lot of medieval battles happened in a very short space of time. And one of the, the reasons for that is that when you're wearing full armour and when you're fighting with a sword like this, you very soon get very, very hot. So you just cannot have a battle going on for a very long period. <laughs> 
this one over here is for one of the main actors, so we had to come up, nice. come up with something that was <laughs> unique to them and it blended with Jenny's costume. So we had to come up with different versions and this one we've split at the back to allow it to be drawn more easily as well. This, they may have done it, they may not have done it, but uh, this was our best guess at how they did it. So if, yeah, you look at this, if you look at this helmet, this would have had a plume in the top, which signified that he was an officer. Also, this face shield mm -hmm. would have signified that he was somebody more important. And it's also there to make them look more fierce to the enemy. Mm -hmm. The Greeks at this time were probably about your height yes. and your size. <laughs> so if you put that on top... I'm tall. <laughs> that makes you a good six to nine inches bigger. <laughs> so it looks make you look fierce. And that carried on into the British Army and the American Army into the 18th and 19th century. I was out there for my cavalry service. When I was there, I learned that you cannot, head on, charge a war elephant on horseback when it's coming at you. The horse belt's left-handed. Well, I go back and read the accounts of the elephant battles of Alexander and his successors. You can see why they make a great detour to the left, why they only bring the, the uh, mounted archers in from a distance to shoot arrows at elephants long range. I've learned that most of the stuff written on elephants by my um, armchair colleagues is inaccurate because they base it on elephants' behavior in zoos. And now everybody is trying to recapture the sense of an ancient battle. I read them with amusement because they're trying to work it out from texts, but I've done it. What do you think is more important when you're working on a film? Is it the, the film or the history? Yeah. We always have to remember we're making a film. We are not doing a documentary, so we're storytellers. But in a lot of the films I do, I'm actually asked to do something that's as real as possible, because the more real it is, the more people tend to believe the story. Do you think people learn more from documentary films or feature films? There are feature films that are very good, that uh, do hit a wide audience, and well, they're not documentaries, but they are feature films. The film called Downfall, which came out a few years ago, about the last days of Hitler and World War II, was absolutely stunning as a piece of history as well as a piece of, of drama. And that's probably the most recent film that's managed to bridge those, the gaps of being a popular feature film, but its historical content was extremely high and extremely good. It is a wonderful way in to the subject for audiences all over the world who may just know Alexander's name. And I am thrilled that professors in America, Germany, France, write to me saying we now show the Alexander movie to our first big year of students. And then we say to them, go away, read the texts, and tell us where you think the film is historically incorrect. We all know that there are places where it had to be, things you can't show, numbers you can't do, but it brings everybody into the subject. If they're good films, they will give us a glimpse of a different time and a different place. And they can give you a, a glimpse of that, then I think they've done their job, whether it be a filmmaker or whether it be a historian. Mm -hmm.